Right boys, so in this series of videos we've been trying to find out the optimal diet for humans or at least ourselves as individuals. The way I've been doing that is reading popular books on diet and nutrition and implementing different diets for myself and seeing how they work, just working by trial and error. So in this video I'm going to talk about the book The Plant Paradox by Stephen R. Gundry MD. So the main premise of this book is plants protect themselves and their offspring by producing toxins in the, floor, in the form of plant defence chemicals or lectins, that's one name for one plant defence chemical, and they produce this in their stems, seeds and leaves. So the paradox is plants also produce chemicals and phytonutrients and just beneficial nutrition for humans. So in one respect they're trying to kill you and deter you by producing toxins and in another respect they're trying to nourish you. So they're trying to kill you and nourish you at the same time and that's the paradox. And the first time I read this book I completely missed the point. I just read the bit where it said they produce toxins and he goes through all the different ways it's trying to harm you. And I was also looking at Paul Saladino at the time and he's very much cut all vegetables out of your diet for that reason because they ha they contain defense chemicals so I missed the point and I went a bit too far in one direction now as far as I can tell the author of this book actually advocates a, a plant-based diet so he's not anti-veg so I had to reread this book and this is why it's been like hurting my brain a bit to reread it because it's I missed a lot of the main points the first time around so small amounts of some plants are good for you, but large amounts of the same plants and even just small amounts of other plants can be damaging. So this is where it becomes like, you want hard and fast rules, but this is like it, the title suggests, it's a paradox, it's a bit tricky. So the author says, there is no doubt that consuming certain plants is essential for good health and therein lies the paradox. So that's the main point. So plants, so if you think about it evolutionarily, everything is trying to evolve in a way that means it will survive. So take other things that you might eat, for example. Take a, a bull or a cow. Now, a bull has massive horns, and if you try and catch it to eat it, it's gonna like go for you with the horns, or it's gonna run away. So it's got its own defense mechanisms in place. Same with people. If you try and come and eat me, I'm going to defend myself. Now, the thing, the organism that can defend itself the most through time is going to be favoured by evolution and that trait is going to develop. The same is the case with plants. Plants want to survive like everything else and they don't want to be eaten. So they put defence chemicals in especially the parts of the the plant that is exposed so the leaves are going to have defense chemicals tubers and roots that are underground might contain less because they're less exposed and seeds are going to contain the most because if you think the seed is the baby plant that is the part of the plant that is most highly defended so seeds have a high concentration of lectins or defense chemicals in them now this is where it gets a bit of a grey area as well because some plants want you to eat them so a fruit wants you to eat it and it actually wants you to eat the seeds because they have a protective hull or a hard shell so it passes completely through your digestive system and you spread the seeds as you move around and defecate in different areas so this is where it gets a bit confusing so Leaves don't want to be eaten because they're immobile, they can't run away. So the only defence they have is to produce defence chemicals. And this is why I've always like thought that kale and certain leafy greens always taste... You can almost taste the chemicals, whereas if you eat something like beef or lamb, it, it, doesn't, ta it doesn't have that strong taste. So some seeds want to be eaten and they won't 
disrupt your, di your digestive system because they pass right through and you don't end up consuming the lectins. Other seeds are more vulnerable and you will you will be consuming lectins. So this is why I think I struggled the first time I read this book. I want someone to just tell me either plants are good or plants are bad, but there isn't a black or white. So if you take spinach, for example, the colour of the leaf, if you look around me in the background here, this is all ivy on the floor. I mean, you get poison ivy, so ivy definitely doesn't want to be eaten. But if this is all ivy, if there was a spinach or a kale plant in amongst that, you wouldn't see it. So the colour of the leaf is its first defence. And then you've got the defence chemicals themselves, so lectins. Now, if there was a ripe mango hanging off of the tree here, you would see it because it's bright red or orange and it wants to be eaten. So this is why logically fruits want to be eaten because you eat the fruit and then you spread the seeds. And also they're high in, they're highly, they're high calories and sweet. So that plant, like fruits, have evolved to be desirable to, to be eaten. So they're high calories, they're vibrant so you can see them, they taste sweet and you don't end up digesting the seeds. Whereas something like kale is green, it's camouflaged into the environment and it doesn't want to be eaten. So this is where I just thought, well, all veg is bad. That's the logical step I took from that. Don't eat any veg. But in the book, the author does recommend you eat plenty of veg. So, and this is where it's an amount thing. Small amounts of vegetables provide good nutrition. So if you think seeds are like the babies of a plant, and if you take babies in our environment, a baby, like a newborn, is going to be the most highly defended time of that baby's life. So if you try and like steal a baby, you're never going to be able to do it with a newborn. By the time it becomes like a toddler, they get a bit more freedom and they wander around. So that's kind of how I visualise it. I was like, the seeds are definitely going to be defended. And then as the plant grows up a little bit, when it becomes a fully formed plant, it's going to have lots of defence chemicals. So it's defended as a seed and it's defended as a fully formed plant. But in between, this is why broccoli sprouts and other sprouts are good because they're like that middle phase where they're, they're not a seed, they're not a fully formed plant, so there's less defence. So that's basically the premise of the book. Now I'm going to go through the main points and some of these have come up in other books. And that's, I always find that good, and this is quite repetitive, and that's good as well, because one, if something's coming up over and over again, then you know it's probably true. And repetition helps you like learn what's, what's good. So sardines, like eating sardines, the three things that come up in every health book are sardines are good, and cod liver oil and vitamin D are the two supplements you need. So they come up on every book, but the more repetition, the better, because then it will just sink in. So one of the points was only eat fruit in season. So sugar equals weight gain, summer equals fruit, and fruit equals sugar. So fruits are produced in the summer and they have a lot of sugar in them. And the body has evolved to know that food high calorie food is abundant in the summer and scarce in the winter so if you're eating loads of fruit your body is is essentially thinking it must be summer this food is only going to be around for a short period of time so we better store it as body fat and it becomes addictive it creates an addiction because it wants you to seek out more fruit so anytime you eat fruit out of season so you could be eating fruit ripe fruit in the winter you're telling your body it's the height of summer and your body is telling you to go and seek more fruit and then it's going to store its body fat. So I'd never really considered this. Most people just think a calorie is a calorie. As long as you're be below your basal metabolic rate, it's all good. But that isn't true because your body is going to crave certain foods and store them in a different way depending on what time of year it is. And you can confuse, you can confuse your body by eating the wrong things at the wrong time. 
So this is kind of like a circadian rhythm or a body clock. You're telling your, your body what time of year it is, what season it is, by the food you're eating. If you're eating a lot of fruit, your body's thinking it's summer. Sweet tastes signal the body to get more calories. So fruit, and I always struggle with this, I add fruit into my diet and then I overeat. And that's because your body is seeking out more calories. And this could be any sweet foods. This is why sweeteners are bad or they're problematic because one, they disrupt your gut microbiome, which is mentioned in this book. And two, they create a food addiction situation because sweeteners are actually sweeter than sugar naturally. That's why you only need a tiny amount compared to sugar. So that's why sugar or fruit is problematic so you can eat fruit and it's got less lectins because it wants to be eaten but it will it might cause you to gain weight this is a point that comes up time and time again you are what you eat and you are what the animal you eat ate so the animal you eat needs to be healthy and the plant you consume needs to be healthy so this is just a, a quick point of eat organic, grass-fed, pasture-raised, wild caught if it's fish, all of those things we already know, but you wanna eat the highest quality foods you can. And he also mentions that you can't always trust labels. And I'm learning this with branding. It's like, for example, I shop at Tesco and I will look at organic. I know organic is good. That, that actually means something, that means the farmers would have had to have used a certain practice to farm that food. Now Tesco do a Tesco Finest range. You've got Tesco Value, Tesco Finest, and people just associate Tesco Value with shit and Tesco Finest with good. And like, each brand will have their equivalent. Finest doesn't actually mean anything. The word Finest, it might have worse ingredients than a Tesco Value food. So finest is meaningless, but organic is not. So if people are buying Tesco finest over organic, that doesn't really make much sense to me. But you also have to be careful with what the labels are saying, because say you buy eggs that are free range organic. They might be free range, but they might be fed organic corn. So that could be a corn fed chicken producing eggs. And that is gonna produce an egg with higher omega-6 and omega-6 is worse than omega-3. So you want low omega-6, high omega-3 in eggs. And the way you can tell is when you crack the egg, the yolk will be very yellow, quite vibrant yellow in an omega-6 egg and a dark orange color in an omega-3 egg. So you want dark orange eggs. So you could get organic free range eggs and they're still corn fed. So this is where it kind of becomes a bit tricky and even with grass fed, they can tell you that an animal, a cow is grass fed. They can do that and sometimes it could be grass pellets or it's not always just walking around a field and eating grass or it could be grass fed for the majority of its life. So like 60% of the time it's grass fed and then 40% it's corn fed. And they'll often do that before the animal goes to slaughter to fatten them up because corn fattens them up. And this is something the author mentions. So make sure you're getting high quality food was the point there. Supplement cod liver oil, a thousand milligrams per day and vitamin D3, 5,000 IUs per day. They're the most important supplements. So the amounts might vary and you might wanna do your own research for your weight or whatever your situation is. But cod liver oil and vitamin D3 comes up over and over. And I have read that you want to have vitamin K2 with the D3. But I don't know the full score with supplementation. I normally just try and get it from my diet. But I did have a somebody that watched my YouTube video, Principal Audio. I won't say his actual name, but Principal Audio, I'm very grateful. He sent me a really long... Um, email explaining some of the supplements he uses in a certain combination and he was having similar symptoms to me and he's done this years ago and done done a lot of research so I'm very grateful to Principal Audio on YouTube uh, sent me an Instagram message so thanks for that. 
so yeah supplementation that might be something I talk about more moving forward but I'm more just trying to hone my diet in at the moment but vitamin D3 and cod liver oil is what I use at the moment so the next point cooking break down cooking will break down some of the lectins so cooking the food will help now this is another point that I didn't have a clue about the breed of the cow determines how good or bad the dairy is so the breed of the cow makes a difference to the dairy it produces so I'm just going to read this from my notes just so I get this right Around 2,000 years ago, a genetic mutation in northern European cows led to the production of casein A1 instead of A2 in their milk. When digested, A1 transforms into beta casomorphin, a lectin-like protein. This potentially triggers immune attacks on the pancreas associated with type 1 diabetes. The Holstein cow is the classic black and white cow, and this is the most common breed of cow worldwide because they are hardier and produce more milk, so they're favoured by farmers. But they produce A1 milk, which is not as good. So A1 casein milk is bad, A2 casein milk is good. Jersey, Guernsey, Brown Swiss and Belgian Blue breed of cows and some Asian breeds are the breeds that produce A2. So I now look for Jersey or Guernsey are the most popular where I live, but you might want to look for those breeds of cows because the protein is going to have less lectin-like substances. Goat and sheep milk is better because it doesn't have this. So, so I just found that interesting. I didn't realise the breed of cow made a difference to the to the how well you tolerate the milk, and that's due to defence chemicals or lectin-like chemicals. Some people are not genetically adapted to plants from America. So again, I'm going to read this one off the phone because I'll probably get the facts wrong here. The Colombian exchange was a transformative progress process of global exchange of plants, animals, disease, cultures and ideas between eastern and western hemispheres following Christopher Columbus's voyage in 1492. So, the Columbian exchange was when Christopher Columbus travelled across to the Americas and then brought stuff back. So before the Columbian exchange, the two groups of people who had little to no exposure to each other were the indigenous peoples of America and the people of Europe, Africa and Asia. These two groups were separated by vast oceans and had developed distinct cultures, societies and technologies prior to the voyage of Christopher Columbus and other European explorers. The Columbian Exchange facilitated direct contact between these two groups for the first time in history leading to the exchange of goods. So, what's this got to do with diet? The explorers brought new, f new world foods back to their native countries and exposed the rest of the world to a whole array of new lectins. These include the nightshade family, so that's like tomatoes, most of the bean family, legumes including peanuts and cashews, grains, pseudo grains such as amaranth and quinoa, the squash family, so that's pumpkin, acorn squash and zucchini, and chia and certain other seeds. All are foods that up until then no European, Asian or African had ever eaten. Half of the foods you have been told to eat for good health are actually new world plants that most of mankind had no prior exposure to, meaning your body, your gut bacteria and your immune system are ill prepared to tolerate them. 500 years to adapt to a new lectin-like substance is a blink of an eye. So prior to the Columbian exchange, when we explore, when Christopher Columbus explored over and then brought new foods back, we would have had like tens of thousands of years to evolve alongside plants. And then we've just introduced a whole new range of plants and we've only had 500 years to adapt to that. So genetically, we're not equipped. So I didn't know that. I just thought, I mean, that was news to me. So I think that's quite an interesting point. And one interesting 
group of foods that came over during this Colombian exchange, which I was interested in because I have an allotment and I grow flowers and fruit. Now normally you'd grow veg on an allotment, but I didn't because I was eliminating veg from my diet because I read this book. Now one of the plant or a group of plants that came over is called the Free Sisters. And this would have came over during the Colombian exchange. The Free Sisters crops refer to three main agricultural crops historically cultivated by various Native American groups in North America. These crops are corn or maize, beans and squash. They were called the Free Sisters because of, because of the way they were interplanted and mutually supported one another in agricultural practices. So they're companion plants and I've learned about companion plants when I grow at my allotment. So for example roses are quite susceptible to diseases so I will grow salvia in with the rose and the scent that the salvia gives off deters the mould and certain like things that would attack the rose. So these are companion plants in the same way. The practice, the practice of planting corn, beans and squash together dates back thousands of years with ev evidence suggesting its existence as far back as 5,000 to 6,000 years. Each of the three sisters provides unique benefits to the other, which contributes to the success and sustainability of this agricultural system. So corn grows up, you've probably seen cornfields, provides tall sturdy stalks for beans to climb around. Its structure also provides shade and reduces weed growth around the base of the plant. Beans are the legumes that fix nitrogen from the air into the soil, enriching it with the essential nutrient. This nitrogen fixation benefits not only the beans themselves, but also the corn and the squash planted nearby, as they can access nitrogen rich, rich soil. So you've got the corn provides an upright, like a pole. The beans fix nitrogen into the soil, which is good for growing healthy plants and the beans grow round the corn, so it's like a, tre it's like a, a trellis that's pre-made. And squash such as pumpkins and zucchini grow low to the ground and have large leaves that help shade the soil, preventing mo moisture loss and inhibiting weed growth. The shading effect of the squash leaves also help keeps the soil cooler during hot weather. So the three sisters all work together, that's why they're called the three sisters, they're three companion plants and it's such a clever way of growing plants in a smaller area. So the three sisters agricultural system was highly sustainable and efficient. It allowed indigenous, it allowed indigenous people to grow a variety of nutrient rich foods in a single plot of land, promoting a balanced diet and enhanced soil fertility over time. This agricultural practice played a crucial role in the development of indigenous civilizations in the Americas. And regarding weight gain, the Free Sisters cropped crops, when combined, provide a diverse nutrient-rich carbohydrate, protein, vitamins and minerals. The availability of these nutrient-rich foods likely contributed to the overall health and well-being of indigenous communities, including healthy weight gain. So, these crops would have come over during the Colombian exchange. I think I've already mentioned that. And specific weight gain. The order keeps saying avoid grains and beans if you don't want to gain weight. And they contain unfamiliar lectins. So they came over during this time and they're unfamiliar to us. And they're in a lot of our processed foods. It's very high in corn. So I might, I'll probably come back to that. GMO, genetically modified organisms are bad. So we know, we probably know that instinctively, but one of the reasons it's bad is because they genetically engineer plants. So they might genetically engineer corn to change the genome of the plant to increase lectins. So this thing that you're trying to avoid, the lectins in plants, they actually turn it up in certain plants so that it can be more resilient to pests. More resistant to insects, 
and that's good for the farmer but it's not good for you so you're now eating they've like put the lectins on steroids so you don't want GMO right this is a completely different point which is better white rice or brown rice I've gone back and forth and I still like wasn't clear on the answer but he gives a definite answer white rice and white bread are better because the whole contains the lectin so the whole on the rice or on the wheat the like outer shell contains the lectins so when you process that and get rid of that you end up with less lectins in your food so I always thought wholemeal bread and brown rice was better but it's not you want white bread white rice and he does mention I just found this interesting that the Romans would like have arguments about which country had the whitest bread and apparently Greece has the whitest bread and I can't remember what time in history this was but the white bread was reserved for the white bread was reserved for the rich and the brown bread was given to the peasants so you want white bread white rice so 10,000 years ago we went from hunter-gatherers eating in-season fruits once a year seasonal big game fish shellfish and starches in the form of plant tubers so these were scarce calories and the population stayed small during this time so this is hungry people essentially we swapped this during the agricultural age and we changed to a lifestyle based on grains of grasses so that's like wheat legumes beans and milk from cows sheep and goats we put on weight quickly and calories were more predictable and more available and as a result we were healthier and population grew rapidly from the agricultural age so so if you eat these things so grains beans milk legumes you gain weight and if you eat like a hunter-gatherer you lose weight and this every bit of research I've done has sort of come to that you so the the point the author's making is eat food your ancestors were used to and that would have been like hunter-gatherer so it's it's the agricultural age has created that's like the start of people getting overweight essentially so you know what to avoid if it was fruits in season and big game so that's like a meat and fruit diet and some tubers and then you convert that to you swap to corn wheat a lot of bread and pasta and stuff like that and then you get obesity so that I don't know if I've done that point justice but that kind of made sense to me so what I did was I got a DNA test with myheritage.com to find out what my heritage was who my ancestors specifically to me were now the author was kind of making the broad point that if you're from the Americas then you're gonna want to eat those like the free sisters or the grains or the um, the foods that came over during the Colombian exchange but if you're from Europe, Africa and Asia, you're going to want to eat what our ancestors would have eaten. So my heritage came back as English, Irish, Scottish and Welsh, the majority. So that's the British Isles and some Eastern Europe. So to me, I know that I'm not from... I don't have heritage over that side so I'm like a pre I would eat like a pre Colombian exchange person essentially so that's how I how I look at it so I don't really I'm not going to be very good on corn nightshades and all those things that came over next point wheat is addictive now I don't know why I don't know how but wheat is addictive so if you end up eating bread and overeating loads of it the author just says wheat's addictive so that might make sense he says what you stop eating is more important than what you start eating so if you identify things that disrupt your gut or that give you issues that's probably because of these lectins and defense chemicals or it might be the milk which has lectin like chemicals 
if you stop eating those your health is going to improve rapidly because you're not you won't have inflammation and an autoimmune response so you want to avoid the lectins to avoid an autoimmune response again this is a point that's come up many times but intermittent fa fasting but intermittent fasting the author recommends it intermittent fasting he recommends a 16-8 protocol, so 16 hours of fasting and an 8-hour eating window. And that would look like eating your first meal at 10am and your last meal at 6pm and then fasting through. Don't use non-stick cookware because of the um, endocrine disruptors. I've done a, two videos on that I think before. Roundup and glyphosate are bad, they're herbicides and if you haven't heard of that, you're probably going to want to avoid glyphosate. You can get glyphosate-free honey and organic is going to help you avoid that. This is another point that's come up before. Extra virgin olive oil shouldn't be exposed to high temperatures. It has a low smoke point and it denatures when you get it too hot. It can be used for like salad dressings and things where it's not getting too hot. But you'll know if you've got a good quality olive oil because it will come in a tinted bottle. So it shouldn't be a clear bottle because the UV can damage the nutrients in it. And it wants to be a glass bottle, not plastic. The safest grains to add back into your diet are white basmati rice from India, apparently. Omega-6 fatty acid is good. Omega-3 is bad. This has come up time and time again. Eating fat is the key to unlock fat storage. So again, this is another one. This is like the keto side of things. If you want to lose weight, you want to reduce protein, reduce carbs and up the fat. Now you can have a bit of protein, but carbs are the worst one. And the author recommends MCT oil, but I like to get it in its natural form, which is coconut oil. So coconut oil, solid coconut oil at room temperature is 65% MCT. Medium chain, medium chain triglycerides and it's a great source of fat so if you increase fat you're going to run off of ketones instead of glucose which is sugar so I've done videos on this before but it's just interesting that it keeps coming up in books that are talking about nutrition and this is why the corn and wheat and things like that help you gain weight rapidly because they're going to spike insulin and you're running off glucose but if you want to lose weight, you want to run off of, you want to drop insulin and run off of ketones, and that's ketosis. Now he mentions cancer, and this is an interest. This is an interesting point. We've talked about cancer before. The mitochondria, which is like the energy generator in the cell of a cancer cell, can't use ketones to generate ATP, which, as far as I understand, is the energy. So it like generates energy by burning fuel. It's like a little furnace but it can't run off of ketones and cancer cells need eight times more sugar than normal cells to grow so if you've got cancer you want to be on a low carb diet you want to be running off of ketones you essentially want to be in ketosis permanently so the best diet for cancer is fasting as soon as you drop insulin and don't eat any food you're running off ketones stored body fat so cancer cells can't run off of that because they can't use ketones to create ATP. And or you could do a ketogenic diet, which is high fat, moderate protein, low carbs. So I just think that's interesting. I've never really heard of anyone get when they diagnose with cancer that that's a recommendation. Now, I don't have much experience with cancer, but that's that's worth knowing. The fact that cancer has to use eight times more sugar and cancer is rampant in our society and we eat a lot of sugar and we have high carb diets. The link, you know like cancer research, I always wonder, cancer research charities have been researching cancer for a very long time and they seem to make zero progress. Now I'm not like knocking charities or cancer because I don't have that much experience but logically there's a lot of money a lot of people donate to these charities and they have a lot of funds and they don't seem to make any progress and you never see the advert where like Cancer Research UK comes on and says all this money we've been raising 
we've actually found out that cancer cells require eight times more sugar to run so a ketogenic diet is probably going to help like there's a lot of cancer research and not much information coming back as far as i can tell but like i say i'm not that deep into it so keto is good fasting is good and sardines came up again in this um in this book so a bit of a long one but that's the plant paradox and the general theme is getting sort of repetitive now so i think we're getting the answers and this is good i'm just going to finish off all the books that i've got i've got a few more books on diet and then we'll get on to exercise but i'm going to keep putting these videos out because i want to get the information down and then i can give the books away and it just helps me to understand it if i have to like teach it to you guys so they're quite long and hard videos to watch i imagine but I'll just keep doing them and then after that we can just get on with the main points and it will be, I don't know, a bit more more vlogs just talking about what I'm doing, what I'm implementing. But yeah, that's the general gist. So the main point I took was plants. It was the paradox that I couldn't get my head around. I like, tell me what to do and I'll do it. And when I saw Paul Saladino eliminate all veg out of his diet, and he says it quite cut and dry, he's like, veg is bad. But I think there's probably a middle ground. They do have nutritional, like, nutritional value, but they do also contain lectins. And again, it comes down to like my life philosophy, the middle way. Don't go fully this way or fully that way. It's normally somewhere in the middle. So you're going to want to eat veg. If you really have digestive issues like the Petersons, they can't eat any veg or fruit, I don't think. But listen to your body, it's worth checking your heritage, and this is something that will come up again. Eat what your ancestors would have eaten. So when I did my heritage, I was basically European. Uh, I was like British Isles and a little bit of Eastern Europe. And I can't tolerate carbs very well. My friend is Italian and he can eat pasta all day long. So he would have his ancestors and all of his ancestors are Italian. So he would have adapted to that. So eat what your ancestors ate. But yeah, hope you got some valuable points there. It's a bit all over the place, but you know, it's, I'm just throwing the information out. So hope you have a good day and I'll speak to you tomorrow.